the benefit of worship is ours alone. Not just that we're going to get rewarded in the hereafter or that we're going to enter into paradise or Allah is going to be happy with us. Worship in this world keeps us grounded, keep the, keeps us firmly on the ground, keeps us our priorities in check. Otherwise, as we'll explain in the next one, our greed and selfishness and arrogance and everything can just take us away if we don't get ground, grounded five times a day in our salat and other things. So then he says he is independent, he's not, the benefit of worship is ours alone. The imposition of worship on us is in actual fact ensuring our entry into paradise. Glory is to Allah, how boundless is his mercy. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Hamdan Kathiran Tayyiban Mubarakan Fi Mubarakan Ali Kama Yuhibu Rabbuna Wayarda Jalla Jalaluhu Amman Awalu Was Salatu Was Salamu Ala Sayyidil Habibil Mustafa Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Baraka Wa Salama Tasliman Kathiran Ila Yawmiddin Amma Ba'd So the last two aphorisms, wisdoms, the uh, two hikam of Ibn Ata'illah that we covered, they were discussing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated various different worships for us, made them a variety so that we don't get bored of them. We get tired of one worship, we do another one. And then certain worships he obligated. You have to pray five times a day, you have to fast in Ramadan, you have to give zakat. Why did he do that for? Basically, that is seen as a chain that he's going to drag us to Jannah with. So the idea is that there's a hadith which says that Allah is astonished by a group of people, meaning by people who are pulled to paradise through chains. It's actually to our own benefit. So there was one aphorism which is 196 on page 115 of the Book of Wisdoms that was left that we need to cover. It's in the same... Uh, may, meaning anyway It just adds another point It says uh, This is Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandari He says Awjaba alayka wujuda khidmatih In another version Wujuba ta'atih Awjaba alayka wujuda ta'atihi Aw khidmatihi Wa ma awjaba alayka Illa dukhula jannatihi He made the service of him Obligatory upon you He made his obedience Obligatory upon you which is, in other words, to say that he made entry into his paradise obligatory for you. So if, you're, if you've ever wondered why all of these worships, lots of people ask this question. If Allah is so independent and he doesn't need anything and he is enriched by himself, he has power over all things, he's self-sufficient, why does he need your worship? Why does he need us to worship? Well, all of these explain that. It's just so that he can put you into paradise. Yes, he could have put us into paradise without the worship. But what, you're going to go and argue with him? <laughs> you're going to go and argue with him? Why did you make it like this for? You see, we live in a democratic world with freedom of speech. So you have a right to criticize most things except certain things. Right, except certain things, right? So you think you, a lot of people literally take that to be part of the deen as well, that you should be able to do the same thing. It's a whole different dimension that they're looking at. But they literally try to take their democratic rights to God and say, I should have a right. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the decisions. He sets down the principles. Nobody, la yus'alu, am, la yus'alu amma yaf'al, wa hum yus'alun. He can't be questioned about anything. But... Because he doesn't seize this with punishment straight away when somebody does that kind of a violation, people get emboldened. And they feel that, oh, I can make these comments and these criticisms, these challenges, and nothing happened to me, so it's my right. Allah protect us. Anyway, Sheikh Abdullah Ganguhi, he comments on this just to finish this off. Allah Most High has made obedience and service to him compulsory. This conveys the impression to the ignorant person that Allah Most High derives some kind of benefit from the servant's obedience and service. However, such an understanding is false. He is independent. He is in no need of anything. The benefit of worship is ours alone. Not just that we're going to get rewarded in the hereafter or that we're going to enter into paradise or Allah is going to be happy with us. Worship in this world keeps us grounded 
keep the, keeps us firmly on the ground, keeps us our priorities in check. Otherwise, as we'll explain in the next one, our greed and selfishness and arrogance and everything can just take us away if we don't get ground, grounded five times a day in our salat and other things. So then he says he is independent. He's not, the benefit of worship is ours alone. The imposition of worship on us is in actual fact ensuring our entry into paradise. Glory is to Allah. How boundless is his mercy. Right. That, with that ends the chapter on the ritual prayer. Now we move on to another chapter which is all about knowledge. How is knowledge viewed in Sharia? What is knowledge? Today, there's an explosion of knowledge or data or information. We're living in an information world of so much information that you can't even handle it. It's just like you have to be very selective what you actually read and what you don't read. We actually probably don't read most of what comes our way, especially if you're on WhatsApp. If you're on WhatsApp and on groups, you get a, a bombardment of various bits of information. Much of which, you know, if you're on religious groups and so on, it actually purports to be religious, beneficial, do this and you get this many rewards and look at this. And, but it's just so much that it just all, almost like seems like a cloud. It's confusing. You'd rather just get one bit of solid information a day or even every two days to be honest, or even once a week that we could actually follow. It's very difficult. And that's just religious information. And then that is all within just general information, news, bulletins, little bits of information, tweets and Facebook posts and Allahu Akbar. It is so difficult. Can you imagine? A lot of people have at least three or four apps. The WhatsApp and the Twitter and the Facebook and Instagram and, 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 and so on. And you have to keep track of all of this. And the more people you follow, the more you're bombarded with this stuff until it's just all just the blur and you don't come out with anything so he's going to answer the question as to what is real knowledge okay then there's this big idea in um, many communities in the world and a number of muslim communities as well is that education 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 and there's nothing wrong with education don't get me wrong here right go and study to the highest degree but then the question is we take a lot of the hadith which are about ilm and we apply them to all sorts of ilm and education that are absolutely selfish endeavors, selfish pursuits of just being an established in this world. A lot of parents want to just establish their children in the world so that they can make a very good salary. But unfortunately, they don't teach them anything else with it. In fact, they sacrifice all other forms of knowledge for this knowledge. You have to become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or a whatever else uh, people are interested in, which is fine. Study to the highest degree. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a big element which is missing because all of this knowledge will only help us in this world for the next 50, 70, 80, 90 years. Unless you're very savvy and you've got the, no the, the, the wisdom with it, the, 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 the reverent fear of Allah, to take that same knowledge. Some people through engineering, they can reach Allah. But there's very few of those. Some people through their medical degree become, mashallah, well, uh, great, much more greatly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've seen people in multiple fields through my travels. Their, 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 their field is something very specific. Marine biology. But mashallah, the amount of knowledge they've Acquired from that about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his nidham, like I'm just amazed. But that's because they are the few from among all of those that have studied that science to see what to benefit from. Most people just do it for the career. So now this is what he says. Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandari rahimahullah, he says, Al-ilm al-nafi' huwa alladhi yambasitu fi sadri shu'a'uh wa yankashifu bihi an al-qalbi qina'uh that's knowledge. So he says, beneficial knowledge. Al ilmun nafi. What is? It? It's all knowledge, but what is beneficial knowledge? Beneficial knowledge is the one whose ray of light 
expands in the chest whose ray of light expands in the chest it has this internal illumination illuminating benefit it makes you feel good it makes you feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uncovers the veils over the heart it doesn't add further veils over the heart it actually uncovers the veils now what veil is he talking about you're wondering what kind of veil is on the heart veils of negligence veils of heedlessness veils of procrastination laziness uh, love of the world is a veil selfishness is a veil pursuit of just dunya for its own sake is a veil uh, arrogance is a veil all of these are veils because they're veiling us from the real benefits that is supposed to take over the heart with any kind of knowledge and do you know that this can also be a something that could be a challenge even when you're studying shari knowledge when you're studying hadith and quran if you're studying it for the wrong reason it will not remove the veil because the reason you're studying quran is to argue with somebody the reason you're studying the hadith is because so you're called a scholar that's also not removing the veil that's actually the selfishness that veil is still there for that purpose so this is beneficial knowledge is the one whose ray of light expands in the breast and uncovers the veils over the heart. So let's see how that is explained. So that was uh, wisdom number 231 for those who have the book, page 93. So essentially the benefit, the, the beneficial knowledge is the knowledge that helps the heart in some way. Makes you feel content, makes you feel satisfied makes you feel connected to, to Allah, which is a natural desire of the human being. Consumerism, when you can buy new products, works in the beginning. You get a new product, you get another new product, you get another new product. Now in the last three years, how many of you when getting a new phone has been as excited as they were when they got their phone seven years ago? The phone, the new phone you got seven years ago much, must have given you a greater excitement than it did in the last two to three years. The reason is that the whole innovation in phone technology, in your mobile phone technology, has pretty much maxed out. So there's nothing new extra. If I get a new phone, it's purely because this one is messed up. So I need a new one and I don't even use any new features of it. There's nothing much more that you can do on that. That's the world. It maxes out eventually and when you've had enough of the world then eventually what happens is that you get a new product there's a dis it's really strange there's a desire I want a new I want a new watch I want a new phone and then you get it and within two days that eagerness that you waited for that phone for for a whole week or for a whole month it's gone that excitement is no longer there I don't know what's happening to the world that like, where are we going with this I don't know where we're going with this it's a major challenge in these last 40, 50 years. We're living a totally different life to how our predecessors lived their life. A hundred years ago to a thousand years ago, uh, people lived a very similar kind of life. But with the explosion uh, of availability of whatever you want, there's no more satisfaction. Initially, there was a lot of satisfaction, but it's what else you do. So that's what he's saying that really beneficial knowledge is knowledge of the hearts Be that is the beneficial knowledge is the one that benefits you and what it means by benefiting you in this context is that it purifies the heart and cleanses the heart of anything that will be to your detriment in this world that will be harmful to you in this world in terms of your interpersonal relationships with others and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for example greed is a bad quality in the heart because what it's going to do is that it's going to cause you a rift with somebody else because when you have greed then you're going to compete with somebody else maybe in the wrong way that may lead you to get into haram earnings haram pursuits uh, to to cheat somebody to swindle somebody to confuse somebody and then uh, take over because of the greed is going to make you arrogant and so on and so forth so that's just because of that bad quality in the heart 
So good knowledge, beneficial knowledge is the one that goes to purify the heart from these bad qualities that sink us and that embellish the heart with virtue, virtues and good qualities. Any knowledge that does that for you, alhamdulillah, that's beneficial. So now think what knowledge is that, that will do that for you. Another way to say it is that beneficial knowledge is the one that helps you to embellish your heart and purify and cleanse your heart and cleanse our inner self from us becoming like dogs and pigs in terms of the bad qualities that they have so that we don't rise like that on the day of judgment to become good people and the true insan so beneficial knowledge is the one that's going to help you investigate all of the different bad qualities and the defects of the self the defects of the heart the defects of our ruh and our spirit the just the all the defects that we hold inside us the bad thoughts that we have in our minds when nobody's watching that we wouldn't want other people to know about we would never want other alhamdulillah allah all praises to allah that he's put a veil so that people can't see what's going on in our mind right so beneficial knowledge is the one that goes to purify all of these things when the heart becomes and the heart and the soul and the ruh and the nafs and everything becomes purified from all of these things then when it becomes purified then good qualities take their place when the greed goes away then this love for others preference for others generosity takes its place miserliness goes away generosity takes its place so then will we'll be filled with proper iman proper belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proper belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially that when we just find it easy to do that which we're required to do from Allah that's proper iman does our iman work for us we call ourselves believers that's why we're sitting in the masjid right now but does our belief work for us which basically means that is it easy for us to do things that our faith dictates that means our iman is working for us Otherwise, we have Iman, but it's not working for us because we are not allowing it to be activated. We've got an obstacle. Uh, yaqeen, conviction in the truth, and not conviction in anything else. When you have conviction in Allah, then you're willing to do anything because you know that that is the truth. Contentment, satisfaction, thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then eventually witnessing His signs everywhere, not missing Him wherever you go. Remembering Allah for every little thing that you can think about a person will then be more forbearing more forgiving when other people make mistakes in front of them Like it's okay for the sake of Allah I forgive right? He'll have more compassion for others He'll have more Generosity more benevolence more preference for others and all the other good qualities so is whatever knowledge your you're acquiring is it benefiting us like that have you noticed that sometimes you just sit with somebody and you're just amazed by the character and it just makes us feel um, much more cognizant of our bad qualities like no I need to get that I need to become like that you stay with somebody who's very generous you stay with somebody who's very loving you stay with somebody who's very diligent who's constantly focused on their prayer or they're constantly remembering Allah it's like man I never remember Allah I never say Allah's name and uh, mashallah some cultures unfortunately the English culture isn't like that right the Muslim English Muslim culture but if you go to Syria for example you go to Jordan you go to many of these countries and Allah's name is taken over and over again whether with concentration or without concentration but it's like he'll meet you and assalamu alaikum obviously and then Allah yu'atika al-afiyah you go to a shop and uh, he'll say Allah yu'atika al-afiyah Allah give you well-being Mu'awwadheen may you be rewarded right um, it's just a number of different statements are mentioned it's just part of the discourse and the thing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is that it's never devoid of benefits somebody wrote a PhD thesis on how to include the remembrance of Allah in education 
in teaching right so those of you who are teachers especially and amazingly uh, what she says is that you start off in the name of Allah and then throughout at least every five to ten minutes you're taking the name of Allah and that could be in the form of Alhamdulillah, look at this, it's so great. Look at uh, the creation of Allah. Look at the Qudra of Allah. Subhanallah, look at this point. So you're constantly mentioning. I don't know how you do that in uh, your public schools. I'm sure you could say, God forbidding. Right? All praises to God. Right? God willing. You just slip in those kind of things. I'm sure you won't get sacked for that, would you? Who's a teacher here? You won't get sacked for that, would you? Is there anybody teacher here? Do you know if that's something? But everybody's scared, man. Everybody's scared. There's somebody telling me that he had a professor who's a good Muslim. He's got a beard and everything. But when you would write to him officially, you know, for his PhD, and you say, Assalamu alaikum, the student was salam, he would never say, Wa alaikum salam. But if he's with him, he'd say, Wa alaikum salam, alhamdulillah, everything. Because he's just scared. He's from another country. I think he's scared of his tenure or something like that. And then there was another professor who wasn't as religious, but he's like, yeah, as alaykum, brother, how are you? Some people feel they're going to lose their jobs. You have to be a bit careful, you know, but still. So he's saying that, you know, knowledge, when you, when you learn something new, that is of beneficial knowledge. So what he's saying is, shu'a'ul ilm, the rays of knowledge. When you acquire something new, you read something, you hear something. So what it's supposed to do in your heart is it's supposed to illuminate you. That's what knowledge does. Knowledge is a light. Remember, knowledge is a light. So how does that play out? As soon as you learn something and you put it in your mind, it beautifies your mind. It illuminates your heart. It's supposed to make you feel good. Does your knowledge do that? Every day that stuff you're reading and wasting time on, does it do that? Or does it darken the heart? Um, somebody sent me something, so I had to download TikTok to view it because they're very, make you, you know, they make you. So I downloaded it. And then I started looking through, and I was like, man, la hawla wa la illa billah. there's no way that you could live with this app. It's haram. It's just got too much wrong on there. Right? Unless you're, but why would you? It's just small little snippets anyway. Like, why would you even be following very specific? I know Zamzam Academy is on there, but um, it, it's just, subhanAllah, it, it's just, so I just uninstalled. Like, I've downloaded it and uninstalled it at least three times because I just don't want it. It's just such a fitna. Right? You shouldn't be on TikTok. I don't see any benefit on TikTok. The other ones, okay, there may be some, some you know, benefit, but TikTok is just pure visual filth. Yeah. It's just... The, the, to be on TikTok, you have to do certain things, it looks like. That is what TikTok's all about. Shouldn't be on there at all. I think that's the worst of the... And I'm not anti-Chinese. That's not why I'm saying this. It's just clearly that's what it is. I mean, I'm not on Instagram, so I don't even know. Maybe that's as bad. So the knowledge, when it comes to you, it's actually supposed to illuminate your inside. It's like a shua. It's like rays. They're supposed to get everywhere. That's the problem he's saying. So what he's saying is that it is supposed to spread over the heart and it's supposed to produce the coolness of Conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to cool the heart down with a conviction. You know, when you're like relaxed with attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're supposed to gain satisfaction with Allah, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the sweetness of faith is supposed to creep in. You're supposed to start experiencing the sweetness of faith. Uh, how do you know all of this? Or how do you know that you're going to have that? Because what that's supposed to do is that's then supposed to create fear of Allah in your heart. A lot of people, they wonder why I don't fear Allah. It's because they're not taking the steps. First, you, you get the knowledge, the beneficial knowledge, and you let that overtake you. When it overtakes you, you get more confident with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get more settled with it. That creates the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That creates an awe of Allah. We need to be in awe of life. We're not in awe of Allah and that He can see everything and He is in control of everything, then we're going to really suffer. And then we become embarrassed to do everything because you can only become embarrassed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you have enough conviction in you that He's watching you all the time. 
Otherwise, why would you be shy? Because you're not even thinking about Allah. Why would you be shy of somebody that you don't even think is watching you? So you can't have shyness from Allah if you don't think Allah is watching you. And you can't know that Allah is watching you until you learn more about Him. And you can't learn more about Him unless you have beneficial knowledge. It all starts with beneficial knowledge. And then after that, once that happens, then you become satisfied. Allah provides contentment through the remembrance. So, what is stopping us? There's a veil. That's what he speaks about. Because he said in his aphorism, he said, beneficial knowledge is the one whose ray of light expands in the chest and uncovers the veil over the heart. So now what is this veil that we're speaking about? The veil is heedlessness, focused on the wrong things. Too much focus on the wrong thing, right? Ghafla. Where does ghafla and heedlessness come from? He says, it's because you're too satisfied with your nafs. That's where that comes from. Okay, so where does satisfaction with the nafs come from? Satisfaction with yourself, like I love myself too much. Where does that come from? He said that comes from love of the world. And, the lo uh, and there's, it's easy to love the world because of the glamour around us. The world is sparkling around us. All the time there's new products coming out, new things coming out, new innovations coming out. Do you think we could probably say that we're living at a time when it's the most dunya? Because dunya is like, I don't know what version of dunya we're living in compared to our forefathers. And then there's certain countries in the world that I, I consider dunya 10.0 compared to others. When you go there, it's just dunya all around you. I mean, in England, it's dunya all around you, but um, I don't know. Just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, if you're getting yourselves into settings of the dunya too much, then that's a problem. Some people feel like, I just can't, I don't have time for anything. Well, you, the setting you're in is wrong. You need to change your setting. That's what hijra is all about. Migration is all about. Migrate from the dunya to less dunya within the dunya but that's what it is there's some places which have more dunya than others there's some places in London where you go and everybody's got a BMW or a Mercedes and if you have anything less than that you're probably going to be looked down upon right so you feel like you need to get the same thing even though you may not want to but then you actually start wanting to subhanallah so then he says the love of the dunya becomes the foundation of every single wrong and from the love of the dunya is where all of the following will start hasad envy jealousy they've got something bigger they've got something faster they've got something brighter they've got something more glamorous so i need to have the same thing hasad you want them to come down you want them to have less that's hasad that's pure hasad right uh, arrogance, you start thinking you have better. Uh, hatred comes into your heart, anger comes into your heart. Why don't I have? Why do they have? Greed, shuh. And then you become more miserly because you want to have more of the dunya, so you become more miserly. And then you want to become the leader, hubbur riyasa. Then you want to be the don, you want to be leading others. And then all of that, what's that creating in the heart is hardness of the heart. It's going to create hardness harshness and obstinacy and stubbornness and then before when somebody said something good or when you heard a good lecture you would be affected it would actually make you feel guilty now it no longer makes you feel guilty though you do feel guilty that you don't feel guilty you don't feel guilty but you do feel guilty that you don't feel guilty sometimes unless it gets worse than that where you don't even feel guilty and you don't care that you don't feel guilty so anyway, it, the beneficial knowledge is where, that, that we, is supposed to help to remove this veil when its rays just shine out and remove this darkness. Because any knowledge to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to have this benefit. That is going to help us. Because if we forget about the hereafter, then you want more of this world because we uh, every human being needs has a greed for something has a focus on something has an ambition for something if we fill that up with the dunya there's no place left 
to attach that desire for the Akhirah because our full desire, the, you know the bandwidth we have in our desire is fully focused on the dunya it's been taken up by the dunya then there's no uh, portion of it now if you can start opening it up okay at least 10% for the hereafter 20% for the hereafter and hopefully by the time we die it'll be 100% for, for, for the Akhirah for the Akhirah that's why he says that this will start slowly, slowly. That's why I always learn something new and beneficial. Seriously, not, seriously beneficial. So then what that will help us doing is that once you start learning more about the abode of the hereafter, that is what will create the zuhud of this world. Meaning abstinence from this world, 5%, 10%, 2%, 3%. No, no, I'm going to abstain from that. I know I could get it. I'm going to abstain from it because I don't need it. Right? I know it's going to cause all of these issues. I don't really need it. I want the hereafter. Then, alhamdulillah, our conviction in Allah, our satisfaction in Allah, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that will benefit us. That's why he says that the first thing that you have to do is to remove this veil. Then the, the rays of the knowledge can be, be of benefit to you. And the reason for that is that we need to try to uh, purify ourselves. And the more we purify ourselves, the more the beneficial thing will have a benefit in our hearts. That's why when the Sahaba heard something, they benefited much more than we benefit because their hearts were pure and uh, cleaner when they started. So, that's what he says. Let me read to you what Sheikh Abdullah Gango he says about this. He says, beneficial knowledge refers essentially to the knowledge of Allah's essence and His attributes. And this is the knowledge that man needs as a foundation for traveling the path of worshipping the Lord. The example of this knowledge is that of a lamp or a candle, right? Imagine you've lit a candle in your heart. It's supposed to now remove the cobwebs, remove the, the dark patches, the dark areas and the dark corners. So when it is cast into the heart of a servant of Allah, its rays illumine his heart and all vestiges of doubts and suspicions pertaining to either the religion or the world are eliminated. I'm, I get calls from people about... I've got this doubt about whether this is kufr or shirk or whether this is halal or haram. Right? So I will answer the question. I don't know the person. And I'm like, that's a genuine question. Then I get a series of similar questions and then you realize that what this person actually needs is solid knowledge. They just need to study a book of fiqh. Because what they're missing is they're missing the absolute basic fundamentals of Islamic fiqh and jurisprudence, that's why they're having all of these small, small confusions. Now, I could answer their questions all day long, but it's a waste of time. Because they're going to have that doubt, they're going to ask question. They have to have doubt, they're going to ask a question, then they get satisfied. Come on, just go and learn, take a course, go to Rayyan Institute, take the Islamic Essentials course. And you learn a bit of everything, that gives you so much satisfaction about your faith. It's your faith. Be conv convinced about it. Why are you going to be doubtful about your knowledge once a, about your deen once a week or twice a week? That's not right. Imagine a person, he's a believer, but then he's doubtful about his iman and his faith once, twice, thrice a week. He cares, but he's, go and learn something. Go and learn about hadith and Quran and tafsir. And you'll see that eventually you get the basis. So he says, once this light comes into the heart, it illumines everything. Uh, and the d doubts about religion and the world are eliminated. Then one proceeds to the, do then one gets to the doors of certainty. And higher spiritual realities open up before the person. And the darkness of the lowly desires is dispelled from the heart. This state of spiritual being is the meaning of the reality of knowledge. Haqiqatul ilm. In fact, any knowledge that is devoid of this quality and effect is not in truth knowledge. Rather, it is merely information. It is just information. Then the next one is uh, pretty much the same, but he says it in a dis different way. This is number 232 on page 94. He says, The best knowledge is the one accompanied by fear. The best knowledge is the one accompanied by fear. So if you want to really benefit from your knowledge, you need to develop fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. Fear of Allah is to perceive, so to speak, the grandeur of Allah. The fear of Allah doesn't mean, hey, I'm scared. I'm just scared, I'm scared. It means that you get to understand the greatness of Allah to such a level in the heart, right? That you just revere Him and then you fear Him in a loving way. 
right? So he says, when knowledge is accompanied by this quality, it is the highest and most beautiful form of knowledge as praised in Allah's speech. Allah says, indeed among his servants, it is but the uh, indeed among his servants, it is but the learned ones who fear Allah. Innama yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-ulama. In order to be a possessor of knowledge and to not merely be a carrier of information, one must be characterized by this fear. The sign of this spiritual state will be a strict obedience to the sacred law. One must understand that fear in the absence of obedience to the sacred law is in reality non-existent. If you think you fear Allah but you have no problem in violating His rights and you know, messing with Salat and other obligations and prohibitions, then that's not real fear. It's only a partial fear maybe if it protects you from something and not from other things. We need to develop that fear so that we don't do anything wrong. One must understand that fear in the absence of obedience to the sacred law is in reality non-existent. A contrasting state of being is when one acquires knowledge while accompanied by worldly desires. So you're learning, you've started your alim course, you've started listening to somebody's lectures or whatever, right, to feel good about it, but you're all, it's also accompanied by worldly desire, such as the yearning for the flattery of wealthy people. I, am, I want to become knowledgeable so that I can attract wealthy people towards me. Or pride, I can be arrogant, I can show off, I can be more knowledgeable than others, people will respect me. Or neglect of the hereafter. When this pitiful spiritual state is found in a person who is taken even to be a religious scholar or alim, then such a person is not to be counted among the inheritors of the Prophet. They may be thinking themselves an alim, but they're not really an inheritor of the Prophet. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. May Allah grant us true and beneficial knowledge uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become greater lovers and focus, people with focus on the hereafter, 5, 10, 15, 50, 60 to 100 percent. So eventually the love of the world will diminish, even though we'll enjoy the world, but the love of the world will diminish from our heart. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين يا الله we ask you for your special forgiveness we ask you for your mercy we ask you for your benevolence we ask you for your generosity يا الله these outstretched hands oh Allah we ask that you do not repel them you do not return them empty O oh Allah, we believe that if you have given us the ability to raise our hands, then that means you must want to give us something. O oh Allah, we can only ask you. O oh Allah, we can't beseech anyone else. All other doors are shut. O oh Allah, all others are incapable. Only you have the capability. Only you have the, in, the ability. You have ability over everything. You control everything. Everything is in your might. Everything is within your power. All things are easy for you. O oh Allah, our forelocks are in your hands. O oh Allah, we are under your control. We are submitting to you. O oh Allah, even the worst of us, when they pray, they pray to you. And they say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. O oh Allah, we ask that you grant us your mercies and your benevolence. And you forgive us our wrongdoings and our heedlessness. You remove these veils from our heart. You remove this occupation in our heart with the wrong, the attachment in the heart. Our hearts are chained and shackled to the love of this world. O oh Allah, we ask that you help to remove them. O oh Allah, that you grant us priorities in our mind for the hereafter. That you grant us abstinence from the world. O oh Allah, you have given us so much of the world. O oh Allah, do not allow us to use the world in your disobedience. O oh Allah, do not allow this world that you have given us, that you have given us more than so many others. O oh Allah, do not make it a source of burden for us. Do not make it a cause for punishment for us. Do not make it a cause for mischief for us. O oh Allah, protect us from the mischief of whatever we have. O oh Allah, grant us beneficial knowledge. O oh Allah, illuminate our hearts with your knowledge. Beautify our minds with your knowledge. O oh Allah, purify our hearts with your knowledge. O oh Allah, allow the rays to overtake us and allow your light to envelope us. Allow your, your light to be infused in every aspect of us, in our sights, in our hearing, 
O oh Allah, in everything that we do. O oh Allah, without your light, the world is a dark place. O oh Allah, the heart is a dark place without your light. O oh Allah, you are the munawwiru samawati wal ard. O oh Allah, nawwir qulubana. Illuminate our hearts, illuminate our minds, illuminate our vision, illuminate our hearing. O oh Allah, illuminate all of our senses. O oh Allah, guide us aright. We are tired of fighting against the shaitan. We wake up in the morning with good intentions, but by the evening we have become corrupt. O oh Allah, we have good intentions in the evening, but by the morning we have fallen into some kind of wrong. O oh Allah, protect us. O oh Allah, grant us your awe, grant us your reverent fear, grant us your khashiyah. O oh Allah, purify our hearts from all evil qualities and imbibe our hearts with the beneficial qualities. O oh Allah, we don't know how much, how much longer we are in this world, but O oh Allah, make every subsequent day better than the previous day and make the best of our days our final days. O oh Allah, protect our brothers in places like Palestine and in the Indian subcontinent and many other places that are suffering from oppression and many other problems. O oh Allah, and we ask that you accept us all for some kind of productivity in this world that people will benefit from that our faith will benefit from and O oh Allah that you accept us for the service of your deen that we can then stand up on the day of judgment and we can have something there we can have something there to hold on to O oh Allah grant us your love and the love of those whose love will benefit us with you O oh Allah accept our gathering here accept our sitting here and accept all of those who make this happen here and O oh Allah we ask that you illuminate the rest of our week and the rest of our lives. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillah. The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam at least at their basic level so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.